Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that everybody survived after the dinner. Uh, okay, so I've, I'm going to tell you a little bit about two types of uh, results obtained during recent years. This is not just the today's results, but results uh, at least obtained in this millennium. So, oops. So there will be two uh, directions. Uh, first about how to try to extend the scheme that I was explaining in the lectures to string-like theories. This is based on the paper from 18. And another part will be on the locality of our, uh, story in high spin theory. And this is based on the series of papers of our group at Lebedev, including Zidenka, Gelfond, and Kerry Booth, and myself. So there are many papers I will focus on the main ideas and uh, we'll discuss the consequences because this is one of the interesting topics these days. And actually both of these topics are very important. Uh, roughly speaking, it will be, each part will be about a half of the talk. Uh, let me start with the first one. So uh, it is interesting to see uh, what is a relation between Heisman theories and string theory. These theories are in some sense similar in particular, they involve any infinite towers of fields and actually infinite towers of high spin fields, both of them, but there are some essential differences. Well, the difference is one is that high spin theories are formulated in uh, anti Sitter space and only contain symmetric fields that roughly speaking correspond to the first rigid trajectory in string theory. So string theory on the other hand, uh, is formulated in the flat background, uh, which if we are talking about maximally symmetric solution. And uh, it contains mostly massive excitations, except for a few zero modes uh, associated, for instance, with the graviton and closed string theory. And uh, uh, the pattern of string theory is far larger than that of uh, Heisman theory. It contains infinite uh, set of rigid trajectories. So roughly speaking, it contains infinite towers like the tower of Heisman theory. So it's infinitely larger compared to Heisman theory. And the relation cannot be um, emitted. Moreover, uh, we'll see that uh, the re one can think about some models that would unify both of these types of the theory in a, to a single class. So the key question, of course, is what is a high spin symmetry that is rich enough to support a string-like extension of high spin theory? And then to try to interpret high spin theory as, oh, sorry, string theory as spontaneously broken high spin theory. So that the high spin states beyond the usual uh, muscle states uh, would be uh, acquiring large masses. So uh, this problem was around for many, many years. It was actually uh, originally, I think it, it goes back to the paper by David Gross and Mend, and many people were talking about this, including the us with Fratin when we were discussing Hirschman uh, theory, it is immediately coming. And for many years, it, 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 it has not been solved. Uh, and actually no progress was almost no progress. I will mention some important papers on this later. Uh, for a rather trivial reason, because the point is that, uh, let me just explain what the difference is and where, where, where this uh, difficulty comes. So first let us start with string theory. Uh, everybody knows that string theory is formulated in terms of modes, mode oscillators that have these commutation relations. Indices A and B are space time, and uh, index N runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, just describing different modes of the string. Well, in addition, there are two zero modes that describe a center mass coordinate and total momentum of string, X naught and P. So, so far so good. So we introduce infinitely many oscillators, uh, obtain this string theory, why don't we do something that's similar in Heisman theory? 
Uh, let's try to do so. Let's just try to add a label like N to all oscillators of the high spin theory that we uh, uh, are aware of, I hope, for the, for, uh, after the, the first two lectures. And so that let's try to introduce many oscillators. Let's M capital be the number of these oscillators with the commutation relations like this. It doesn't matter how these additional indices are organized from minus infinity to infinity or whatever, just add some of the number of them. And then immediately the problem arises because if we will try to realize space-time generators in terms of these new oscillators, then this works as a tensor product when just sums over the modes. And if doing so, then immediate consequence is that the um, uh, total momentum P0 in the theory, it's expressed in terms of bilinears of these oscillators. And as is standard in quantum mechanics, this leads to increasing of the vacuum energy due to these oscillators. Uh, because after being normal ordered, whatever normal ordering is, it depends, of course, on the, how you define your Hilbert space. That's I, I'm not going to discuss, even though it's not difficult to discuss at all. But I'll get that the vacuum vacuum energy will be increased by a constant factor uh, proportional to the number of oscillators. Each will contribute uh, one half to this uh, story. Okay. But this has immediate consequence that the lowest energy now increases with M. And uh, where if we introduce lambda, then it becomes M times lambda. But to have a graviton on the spectrum, we, we don't need this increase with M. We need something three lambda forever. We need this is the graviton, nothing else on anti sitter. So by proceeding this way, one immediately runs into difficulty that there is no room for graviton, which means that there is no room for gravity, which means that this theory is not particularly interesting in the, as a theory of gravity, as extension of gravity. So here is the problem. Okay, so, okay, why does <laughs> not, yes? Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I have a question. But, uh, what happens if you consider an infinite number of oscillators, then we can imagine that we'll be renormalizing the energy. No? Well, yes, <laughs> declare that infinity is equal zero. Uh, in principle, or free half. No, oh, it's a cheating a bit, huh, of course, but. Uh, uh, yeah, but you know, uh, yeah, but this, uh, I don't know how to do this, number one. I will explain why this does not happen in string theory number two, and later I will explain how to resolve this problem number three. Let's discuss after, okay? Thank you, Ian. Uh, on the other hand, I think the, co the consequence is that anyway, the resulting algebra will not have unitary representations that will contain massless graviton. But if you declare even that this is zero, you should con construct linear spaces where this symmetry is realized and where this. Uh, weights take um, energy in particular, take uh, appropriate values. That I think is not possible whenever true, but whatever trick with uh, zeta function regularization one will try to do. Anyway, but I will explain how to proceed because otherwise I would not be giving this talk here or, or not discussing this work. Okay, but let's first go back to string theory. So why does not uh, this happen in string theory? Oh, for a very simple reason, because string theory, as I said, is formulated in the flat background. By the way, let me emphasize that what I mean by saying that string theory is formulated in Minkowski space, it means that I'm talking about a maximally symmetric space in the full and the 10 dimensional string, if I'm talking about 10 dimensional string. So this is uh, not related to, for instance, ADS5 cross S5 and other curved geometries. I'm talking about uh, maximally symmetric space, space time. So in this case, the Minkowski is appropriate and lambda is zero. And therefore the contribution of uh, these extra modes to momentum 
somehow goes away because the momentum is described by the P node operator, the center mass momentum, uh, where uh, modes of os oscillating modes on the string do not contribute. There is no contribution from this infinite set of uh, uh, string oscillators to the momentum of string. This is the point. At the same time, this argument immediately explains one explains that it is, uh, in my eyes, impossible, maybe one can say hard, unless one is doing some regularization or I don't know what, but it is difficult to go to anti-decider in string theory, precisely for the reason that I have mentioned. All these uh, oscillating modes of string, they contribute to Lorentz momentum and uh, they rotate or they have to rotate all indices. And because the commutation relations in anti de Sitter have the, has this form, this means that they must contribute to P. If they will contribute to P, then the same problem will occur as I mentioned in, 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 in the higher spin uh, problem. So string theory, it's not incidental that it is difficult to deform it to anti de Sitter. Okay, so on the other hand, higher spin theory, as we know, demands anti decider maximally symmetric space. And so we arrive at the conclusion that actually, most likely, there are uh, two different regimes in some hopefully unified theory that unifies both of them, such that one is more appropriate to string theory, another to higher spin theory. And the important difference in particular is because of the geometry. Uh, possible geometry and, um, well, this issue that we somehow should find something that is more general than both of them. So this is where we are. And as I said, for a long time, it was not possible how to do that. So I'll now try to explain uh, what is the way out of this problem. And it looks like, indeed, the models that result they have a good chance to be related to string theory in a certain regime where Harrison symmetries or generalized Harrison symmetries that I will explain uh, will uh, be spontaneously broken. Okay. Uh, so the solution to this problem actually was found uh, accidentally uh, uh, well, uh, while we were studying with Olga Gelfond the three-dimensional boundary conformal theory <clears throat> for free fields. And the problem that we were solving was to find just explicit form for the operator product expansion algebra for currents, J2, which are just usual currents built out of free fields. And we were considering the theory of free fields. So in principle, it's very easy to find this algebra for any particular current, but to get some unifying formula, uh, it is less trivial. So we have infinitely many currents because they are built of fields of all spins and they themselves carry an arbitrary spin. So there are, the, there are three parameters that uh, uh, run from zero to infinity. So. Uh, so we were playing this game in terms of uh, Y like a spinner uh, variables like Y and W here. And we were using the unfolded machinery basically mechanism to solve this problem. And that worked very efficiently. So we managed to find this algebra. And what happened is that when we looked at the result, we realized actually it was Olga who first suggested this that the resulting algebra is nothing else, or let me say modulo some Fourier transformers, some elementary operations like this, is nothing else else as universal developing algebra of the higher spin algebra. That was a kind of surprising result. So we found, we started with uh, free fields due to higher spin theory in the bulk. And we found that <clears throat> the operator algebra of currents, which are dual to fields in the bulk, is just universal developing algebra of the higher spin algebra. Let me emphasize that this is a huge algebra because H itself is infinite dimensional and universal developing algebra for any finite dimensional algebra is uh, infinite dimensional. So here we have a doubling on infinite, infinite dimensionalities, let's say. Uh, and then, 
immediately after that, we realized that the problem actually in this framework is resolved. For this algebra, there is a room for many oscillators and there is a room for graviton. I will now explain how. how. But let me emphasize that actually there was a work by Anquist and Sandel in two, um, 2005. Uh, they were playing also with the uh, ideas uh, from boundary uh, in terms of singletons. They were constructing so-called what they call singleton string. And they were playing with um, objects pretty much reminiscent of this uh, uh, OPE that we have found. It's not exactly the same story. They are different. And as far as I, ca I can see so far, I can work with our algebra and I'm not sure I can work with Enquist and Sandel, but they maybe know some other ways. That's, I, um, I wouldn't comment. But basically the algebra, the, 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 in the very end of their paper, they, they contain something very much reminiscent to, to what I have said. Now, how the problem gets resolved in this framework? Actually, it's elementary. It's amazing that it, the solution was missed for many years. The point is that if you look at the commutation relations underlying this algebra for, so to say, uh, elementary oscillators, indeed there are infinitely many of them. And the commutation relations take this form where a new entity appears, this IN. IN is a substitute for unity that was implicitly on the right-hand side of the oscillator commutation relations originally. And this uh, IN is some central element that commutes to everything. And as we'll see later, it's actually is a projector, it uh, squares to itself. And its appearance changes the story completely because depending on the representation, some of these I's then can be zero sometimes, and that can reduce vacuum energy to the value that we want it to be reduced. So this is the a story about this algebra. So this very minor modification actually changes the story. And it turns out that massless fields, not only graviton, uh, are uh, in the representation of some representation of this universal dynamic algebra, which is obvious because representations of H itself form representations of universal unwelding algebra. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Is everything fine? I mean, excuse me? Xavier? So it's working very well. Yes, sorry, the microphone was not. So, yeah. There was, I got some message that uh, there was some sound problem, was it really? Shall I continue or? Please, please, yes, yes. You're yeah, fine. sorry, because I, I was, uh, I got a message from the system that something went wrong. All right. So now let me explain how uh, one can use this to go to the st uh, to our string. And, oops, excuse me. Yes. So first, uh, uh, we have to find some algebra and some field equations that would result from gauging the, this generalized multi-particle higher spin algebra that I have just introduced. And uh, it's called multi-particle because actually I remember, let me go back a little bit. I remember I was arguing that, uh, uh, or actually I was not arguing in these lectures, but I usually am arguing that Higher spin algebra is actually a maximal algebra that acts on the single particle states at the boundary. This is a rather well-known fact by now. Uh, and it looks like that naively, uh, what can be larger? The point is that the universal enveloping algebra of higher spins, it acts on all multiple, all states and not only single particle states, but all multi-particle states. And actually it mixes all of them. That's why it becomes so infinite dimensional, so large. Now, uh, now I'm going to explain you how one has to modify the system to be able to derive uh, nonlinear equations for the appropriate sets of spins. And this I call multi-particle 
models and also Coxeter models because Coxeter groups are actually underlying this story. Well, to begin with, uh, let me start with the usual oscillators, A plus minus, and uh, introduce also this Klein light. Is there a question? question. So this yeah. multiple construction is uh, dimension dependent or independent? Uh, is dimension dependent? Yes, I'm, I'm talking. Let me answer this question. One can do this in any, I mean, after you realize what it is. It is not necessary to do computation at the boundary. You can just start with this inversion construction for the stretch. Since we know all higher spin algebras in any dimensions, we can use this machinery from, from this point. And equations and will be formulating. They will be kind of four dimensional, but you can go to higher dimensions as well. I can answer this question maybe later when I will write equations. Okay, so we introduced these plus minus operators. We introduced Klein operator that is, should be familiar for us now. And the usual oscillator algebra has this, uh, can be rewritten in terms of symplectic terms, putting alpha instead of plus and minus. And there was, uh, there exists a very interesting, very important deformation of this algebra, implicitly introduced by Wigner first in 1950, who, uh, modify the commutation relations uh, in, in such a way that uh, it leaves for him, left for him a possibility to uh, uh, organize a spectrum in an equidistant way. I'll explain how it works in a moment. Uh, so he did not write these formal algebraic relations. He just wrote an operator on the right-hand side in the Hopf space. So, but it's useful to have the general construction that I'm presenting now. It was actually rediscovered by many people in different forms and then there is a very good company. And I, I also rediscovered and independently learning about the Wigner paper later on. What, uh, okay. So we have uh, these commutation relations and then we can construct bilinears of this modified or some people call them deformed oscillators. The really remarkable fact is that sp2 that is normally associated with usual oscillators in terms of bilinears remains sp2 it, it, it is not deformed commutator of t alpha beta to a gamma is just has standard form uh, which is insensitive to the value of the uh, new parameter that is a number and what this fact actually explains uh, what Wigner observed, he was looking for a Hamiltonian such that despite the commutation relations have been changed, the basic commutation relations uh, with Hamiltonian remain the same and they remain. This is a, one of the generators T alpha beta. And if this equation immediately tells you that I can solve a quantum mechanical problem pretty much like in the textbooks in quantum mechanics or how you explain it to students, so you can just generate the whole module and the energies will be, uh, will differ by just uh, uh, the same value, except for the vacuum energy is new dependent in this, in this language. And this is what uh, all what have changed. The vacuum energy changes, but other levels are still equidistantly uh, distributed. Okay. So this is we know, and actually let me emphasize that the field equations of uh, higher spin theory that I was explaining were based precisely on that construction with the replacement of the uh, K, uh, of new, excuse me, by the field B that is a generating functions for all gauge invariant object in the system and replacing uh, time sum parameter eta that was a coupling constant in the higher spin theory. So if we know such an algebra, we can immediately try to uh, write down higher spin equations by this trick. And now let me uh, uh, comment on the issue uh, when the, there are many oscillators. Okay. Uh, so extension to the n body calogera model, I probably forgot to say that the oscillate, the simplest oscillator and the model constructed by Wigner happened to be the same as Calogero model to body Calogero model later. It's, this is just a spectrum for that model that was discovered before 
the name of Calogero model was invented. So now we consider n copies of oscillators. So they uh, now take um, the label i takes n values, and we also will introduce uh, Klein like operators that permute these oscillators. Kij just by this relation replaces i by j upon being moved to the right. So this relation is just described for us symmetric group, nothing else. Uh, so this is the, can be considered as defining relations, which make no difference between all i and j. And then there is a deformation of the commutation relations for oscillators of this type. Here there is a parameter new as well. It's uh, the same as in the Calogier model, arbitrary constant, and some combination of the uh, these generalized client operators. And this deformation it was found by many people independently. Uh, I think originally it was found by Cherednik, but I was not able to find the paper. I just referenced to, to, to his work, but definitely it was found by Dunkel who found the representation of this commutation relations. I don't think that the algebra was given in, in his paper that I read after. Also, almost the same time, it was found by Patrick Ranakas and Brink Hansen and myself. And let me mention that this paper resulted from uh, accurate visiting seminars because Hans Hansen was a condensed, is a condensed matter physicist. And he was talking about anions and the uh, Calogero model as a dimensional reduction of the anion physics and arising some good questions that later received good answers. So what is remarkable about this algebra is that it respects Jacobian. If you consider second commutator, compute Jacobi, you'll get that it is zero, which is not at all obvious from this form. Uh, it takes some time to check and this is uh, uh, much easier to um, prove using the more general construction of Coxeter groups that I will, I'm coming to. Okay, so this is n-body Calogero model now, as now people know very well in this field. Well, if you single out the central of mass coordinates, it just decouples from the rest and relative coordinates uh, describe you uh, interactions in the Calogero model. And again, uh, the same phenomenon happens that if you organize the sp2 generators as it would be organized for usual oscillators as anti commutator then still it has the sp2 properties with respect to all of those oscillators. So the commutation relations one here, formula one, are uh, insensitive to the value of new in the algebra. Of course, one can... Uh, take away the uh, central of mass coordinates and what is left will be uh, a true Calogero model with mutual interactions. And for n equal two, for two body Calogero model, one recovers the deformed oscillator algebra I explained in the previous transpar uh, transparency. Coxeter groups. So there is a very useful extension to the Coxeter groups and I'm not giving it because uh, it's just a fancy mathematics, it's not, too fancy, by the way, but it's very beautiful. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I will be explaining this because the conjecture is that it is one of those Coxeter groups that has been chosen in order to reproduce string theory as we, I mean, um, there are some arguments. So generally Coxeter group is some, something very simple. One uh, considers a rank uh, p-dimensional vector space and consider some set of roots called VA here. A has nothing to do with the space-time indices anymore. And the roots are such that one defines re reflections with respect to any of these roots, with respect to any V here. So reflection on X uh, acts like it should be, it's just reflection changing component along V, squares to one, and reflection with respect to V and minus V is the same. And then the condition is that the group generated by all these reflections should be finite. This is a very strong condition. And uh, there is a classification of all Coxeter groups. And in particular, uh, all while groups for simple Lie algebras are Coxeter groups. So this is a, a very important case. And this is what I will need. But the full classification is slightly larger. 
although it's not uh, terribly difficult, complicated. Now we can uh, generalize the construction that I have explained to you to the general Coxeter group instead of just a symmetry, symmetric group for permutations. And it works like this. And this is, uh, well, it's attributed to Cherednik. And I think indeed he, he is the right name for who first discovered this construction. And even earlier in some of his papers, according to the titles of those papers, he discovered the construction that I was giving before. Uh, so, uh, we, we just write that commutator is now starts with a uh, unit term. And then there is a contribution that is organized by root vectors, those that generate reflections, client type operators that uh, change the uh, oscillators according to the representation of the Coxeter group. And also there are constant new here that may depend on V. So this is the construction. And again, actually for any new of V, these computation relations respect Jacobi. And this is a really a remarkable fact. And in these terms, it's, it's very easy to check. It's not a big deal to check that it respects. Indices alpha and beta still are two components, still take two values. Okay, good. Uh, what else? So it has remarkable properties for every Coxeter group. And uh, apart from Jacobi, uh, one can de demand that the whole story should be invariant under the action of the Coxeter group itself. And this imposes conditions on the constants. Jacobi are true for any constant nu of V, but uh, the covariance on, uh, with respect to the Coxeter group C demands this nu of V uh, functions be functions on the conjugacy classes, not just arbitrary functions of V, but constant on the conjugacy classes. And there are as many constants as many conjugacy classes in the respective Coxeter group. SP2 is again around, and this plays a fundamental role in higher spin theory because it is responsible for actually Lorentz invariance in the four dimensional model <clears throat> that I have been considering. So Lorentz symmetry, it's okay. Well, A and series and BP series, A and B uh, is very simple. A is simply the symmetric group where the root vectors are given by these vectors in the, N in the P dimensional vector space where E form an orthogonal basis. Actually one goes to RP plus one and then takes away the center mass uh, coordinates, so as, as a result, one is left with a p-dimensional space. Well, BP is almost the same with the addition that one, in addition, one can change the sign of every uh, basis vector, EN. So this gives you BP series. It has more uh, reflections, and it has actually, uh, the difference is that now there are two conjugacy classes, and these are precisely given by this R1 and R2 shown here. So there are two conjugacy classes, and this means that the corresponding Cherudnik algebra has two independent coupling constants. Uh, I will argue that string theory has to be, is supposed to be related to the case of B2. And in this case, there will be two coupling constants, and I'll discuss their role later on. Yeah, but so far I have been considering Cherudnik algebra as a deformation of ordinary oscillatory algebra. Now we have to find the room for those uh, at importance i that should be introduced to make it possible to resolve the uh, low uh, ground energy problem. And this is uh, very elementary to do and just introduces as many i's as pairs of oscillators demanding them to commute to, with everything and to be uh, projectors to be at importance. And then the modified Cherudnik relations are have this form where K hat uh, is built out of the original uh, clan like operators by multiplying this at importance. And that's it. And still all the properties remain uh, true. Good. 
So higher spin equations. Now it uh, can be done in one shot. Just take this algebra, replace parameter new by new parameter, which is called eta here, pretty much like in the higher spin theory, times b. b is the field now that is generating function for all zero forms in the system. And why can it be inserted here? For a simple reason, if you remember higher spin equations, they tell us among other things that B is covariantly constant, both with respect to space time and with respect to uh, S uh, field that uh, is on the left hand side, which is a connection in the Z space. So what equations tell us that it commutes to them. And this means that it behaves like a central element from that perspective. So if you plug this B into these equations, then the fact that Cherednik uh, uh, satisfied Jacobia tell us that the resulting system is automatically uh, consistent, okay? And this implies gauge symmetries and uh, formal consistency, and you can analyze interactions at every order and so on and so forth. Now there are two coupling constants associated with the two conjugacy classes, eta one and eta two. And um, they play a different role. So eta two, is as before <clears throat> it was in the higher spin theory. It's more or less <clears throat> the, the same, plays the same role. It's a coupling constant that is not, well, okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, out, I'm running out of time. So let me skip that. But eta two, uh, eta one plays a very important role. This is last uh, slide on this uh, uh, string like higher spin theories. It's actually exchanges the order uh, of arguments y because talking about B2 means that we have twice as many spinner variables in the four dimensional case or oscillator variables in the higher as in the usual case of B1 or A1 that corresponds to standard higher spin models. So rather at two y's. And one of those cases just exchanges y1 and y2. If there is a string of such, one is left with a combination that's y1 times uh, y1, y2, then y2, y1, then y1, y2, star products between, which is pretty much like matrix product. So this string is analogous to the single trace operators in ads CFT that are, appear in the string theory. They don't appear in the, in the uh, vector higher spin duality. There is no room for, uh, the difference between, I mean, uh, multi-trace and single trace or, well, other operators are single trace from that perstective. And this is one analogy, which is very stri uh, striking. And uh, finally, I should probably comment uh, on the, the another very uh, remarkable fact that happened to be true in these models is that if one would think about this model in the boundary terms, then the most natural a boundary solution to make sense of it. One should demand it to be supersymmetric. And you can guess what supersymmetry is demanded. It's n equal four. If a supersymmetry is lower, then there is some problem with the boundary operators that develop infinities. But if it is n equals four or, or higher, then this problem disappears and the theory is completely well-defined. Uh, okay, so uh, if we demand the boundary theory to be free of higher spins, at least in some limit, uh, then the only candidate is n equal four. And this is how the n equal four super young mills shows up in this setup, which is very appropriate for a model that is going to be a generalization of string theory. Okay, uh, I think I finished this part. It took a little more time than I thought. But anyway, if there are any questions on this, it's probably the right moment to ask. If no questions. No, no, there is. Okay. Can I? So in the four dimensional case, so I understand you have the particles of the first associated to the first trajectory. Together, you can act on all multiparticle states. Yeah. Okay. How many first rigid trajectories can you have? 
Well, it's a uh, uh, spectrum of theory. Uh, and there are differences. Even when I said that Maslow's power spin theory corresponds to the first Regis trajectory, that is not completely true because it's similar, but not quite. Because that was a trajectory of massless fields, and every massless field carries power spins, carries less degrees of freedom than a massive. Instead That's fine. That's fine for me. I can rephrase the question. I, I agree with what you said. I can rephrase the question. Take the spectrum of massless particles associated yeah. to uh, tens, symmetric tensors of each rank, one copy for each. This is yeah. what we can loosely call the spectrum of massless first range trajectory. Yeah. So my question becomes, how many such massless first range trajectories can you have in the four dimensional oh, yeah. cases? Okay, the last, uh, yeah. Well, this is precisely, uh, yeah, it's, it's just one. I mean, the, the usual higher spin theory is a subsector. And the other states will would correspond to kind of higher rigid trajectories. Other will be uh, multi-particle states of this one, let's say. Does it uh, answer your question or? Yes. Okay. Okay, let me now go to the locality issues, which is uh, uh, an interesting topic these days, I guess. Uh, and I'm, as I said, I'm short in time. So this part of the work is based on the works with uh, <clears throat> the Lebedev group, and namely Didenka, Gelfond, Kribut, and myself, <clears throat> that uh, was uh, done during last years. And uh, some paper uh, appearing that, this year that is not indicated here, but I will mention it later. Okay, so first, uh, what is local, what is non-local? Well, I will be talking about perturbative locality which means that I will be talking about how many derivatives one can expect to see at the interaction terms, at nonlinear terms. And the naive definition is that for perturbative locality is that if we have a finite number of derivatives, it is called local. If there is infinitely many derivatives, it's called non-local. Good. It's good for usual theories. It's not so good for high spin theory or for any other theory where there is an infinite number of fields around. Because in that case, one can distinguish between three possibilities, three options rather than two. <clears throat> well, local is a finite number of derivatives at any order for all fields at once. And this never happens, neither in uh, high spin theory nor in string theory. So spin local, this is different a little bit because it demands to have a finite number of derivatives at any order for any finite subset of fields. This is spin locality, or at least one version of spin locality. Take a subpart, you'll find a finite number of derivatives. We have seen this at the cubic level already when I was explaining the structure of cubic interactions. Uh, there, uh, we had the finite number of derivatives for every vertex for every given spin. This is spin locality. So there were no infinite chains for a given set of spins, um, which would imply non-locality and genuine non-locality uh, when uh, formulating it's more or less axiomatically. This means that there is a finite subset of fields where an infinite number of derivatives in, the, in every order or some order of interactions appears. So these are the three options I will be talking about. I will be distinguishing between uh, filter definitions. Again, uh, one can consider filter definitions that are local or non-local, and also spin local, of course. So uh, local is a finite number of derivatives. Non-local has infinite number of der derivatives. And one should keep in mind that making a filter definition with an infinite number of derivatives, which is non-local, applying it to a local theory, one will get something non-locally looking at least. And the problem therefore is uh, rather non-trivial is how to find a, a appropriate set of variables where the theory is either local or spin local or minimally non-local, whatever it is. Taking just an arbitrary frame in terms of the coordinates uh, of these fields phi, one 
uh, has a risk to, to get some seemingly non-local story, which does not mean that the underlying theory is non-local. So spin locality in the four dimensional high spin theory. Well, I will refer to the equations that I uh, presented in the lectures. These are free equations for higher spin fields. Uh, if you don't remember details, never mind. What you should appreciate at this point is the point that I have already emphasized in the lectures that some of this equation, namely this two star equation, it relates d dy d dy bar with d tilde and therefore with the x. So in this language, the space time derivatives are related to y derivatives by this formula. <clears throat> and this is what allows us to interpret the results obtained in terms of spinners in terms of space-time derivatives in this language. And that is uh, the key point because of course we will be using the language of spinners because it's far simpler than direct analysis of high spin interactions in the, uh, directly in terms of usual fields and space-time derivatives. So high spin vertices already, this is uh, you know, again, it's a part of the lectures that I gave. In the unfolded machinery, they have this form where there is a first term omega star omega that is uh, uh, results from the higher spin algebra and some nonlinear deformations expanded in, in powers of zero form C. So uh, generally, uh, well, some first corrections have been found very long ago, but they were non-local, definitely. And the issue of how to go to the local frame this is the issue I'm going to tell you about. But there is some very remarkable distinction between locality and spin locality in terms of these Y operators. And that is something that I want to emphasize. All these vertices will contain some functions of derivatives in Y and Y bar. They will be Lorentz covariant, of course, Lorentz invariant. And that's why these are contractions of DDY, DDY with respect to spinner indices with indices i and j referring to arguments of particular factors of c are different. So the, all these gamma or upsilon, they are uh, organized in terms of functions of these uh, differential operators and spinner variables. And uh, they are non-polynomial. And to have a local theory, one should demand this function to be polynomial function of p and p bar, but as I said, this never happens in, string theory, in higher spin theory. So non-local story means that these functions are non-polynomial. So there are some power series in, in, in powers of P and P bar. And this is the non-locality. However, there, there is an intermediate case which precisely corresponds to spin locality. This is the case when uh, it, it's polynomial either in P or in P bar for every uh, set of pair of indices i, j. If this happens, then that precisely guarantees spin locality for a very simple reason, because we remember that this operator is d dy, d dy bar, so that for a given spin, uh, the number of y and y bars kept fixed, it's, related to, it's, it's, it's just related to spin, uh, the difference between y and y bars. And this means that if a fix spins, it's enough to demand that uh, there is a polynomiality either in Y or in Y bar to achieve that the total number of space-time derivatives for a given spins, for a given spins is finite. This is spin locality. So the relaxed condition is that we would look, we're looking for these vertices such that these differential operators would be uh, polynomial in at least uh, galamorphic or anti-galamorphic sector. And this is what uh, is possible to do. So we we'll start with this full system of nonlinear equations that I will not go into detail, just to, to remind you how they're organized. There is star product. The star product is uh, again a while algebra, but in slightly different ordering, which is a normal ordering, uh, Never mind. So what is, what is important is that, of course, it is non-local, as is obvious from this integral formula that is equivalent to Maillard-like formulas. One can derive one from another. 
And this is the non-locality that actually is going to be mapped to the space-time story. Then one develops perturbative analysis, while the important part is associated with the field S. Field S at the lowest order behaves as the RAM differential and Z variables. And this means that uh, one can expand order by order. I have explained this in, in, in the lectures, but the main equation looks like this. So dz of some unknown at every next order is expressed in terms of the previously obtained uh, objects. And that can be solved. And here the formula is almost the same as I gave in the lectures with a little difference that this operator that is referred to as contracting homotopy operator, it now depends on the parameter Q. And Q is a shift that I will explain in a moment how it is organized. And there is, again, there is a freedom in the solution to the homogeneous equation up to homology H and exact form, DZ form, uh, DZ of epsilon, whatever epsilon is. So interpretation we have been discussing, the epsilon is for gauge symmetries and homology is for filter definitions. So we can, in principle, find any uh, system, derive any system and any uh, appropriate variables. And this is very uh, important that uh, we are guaranteed that we do not miss anything. But the question is how to single out appropriate frames of field variables and how this is mapped to the question whether there is a preferable choice of this shift operator Q and this operator Q is demanded to commute to dz, not, nothing else. I will give you explicit formula for the contracting homotopy operator, you will see what happens. So, but the answer is that there is a very specific choice for this shift operator, namely beta times ddy. Beta is a parameter, is a number. And in the limit, beta to minus infinity, somehow uh, non-local tails of higher derivatives decouple and, uh, and uh, go away. So that one is left in all those examples that we know with uh, local or spin local vertices, let's say. And these were derived up to the quintic order. So th there is a lot of um, very explicit results that show that the story is going to be spin local. So this shift to homotopy is given by the first line. You can see that basically what we do, we replace uh, Z factor in the conventional Poincare homotopy formula by Z minus some shift and uh, do the same because the formula is uh, uh, insensitive to what you call Z. You can, by Z, you can call Z plus any constant. You can, of course, do that. The a little bit tricky point is that this shift is not necessarily a number. It may be an operator that simply commutes with DDZ, like DDY in the example I gave you before, or it can be an operator acting on arguments of C. So as every uh, contracting homotopy, it obeys the resolution of identity, which means that it almost always is just identity operator, this commutator with DZ, except there is a contribution from the homology part that cannot be represented in the uh, resolved in this way. Uh, one can compute this projector to homology, and this is the uh, one of the main formula for the analysis uh, that allows one to uh, compute. Well, um, so the interesting point well, that was identified even before that the functions that appear in the perturbative analysis of the higher spin theory are very well organized. And the, the key property of these functions is how they behave near the uh, boundary points of this integral near zero and near one. So normally they, uh, these functions that appear, not normally, but the, the, there is a theorem, they always obey these conditions. That means that they do not develop, uh, they are not more singular than T to the power p minus one in this case and other way, other way around in this case. Um, it's not necessarily singular, they may be polynomial, but anyway, this behavior is uh, fixed once for, for a while, uh, for, for forever. Okay, so we see that there are some special classes of functions and actually this uh, 
uh, looking at these functions allows us to uh, um, uh, control uh, the level of non-locality by some theorems that I will be able probably to articulate, but uh, not go into detail. Well, there is a remarkable formula that uh, explains how the star product of these functions is organized. Um, well, the only important part is that this red part that the exponential containing z alpha y alpha contains a factor t1 circle t2, and this product is commutative and associative, uh, which is an elementary fact, uh, a little bit surprising for the first sight. Well, the whole story about uh, <clears throat> controlling locality is based on the elementary integral that one can compute easily, showing that uh, the behavior uh, when the, this product appears and when one replaces it by new parameter tau, then actually there is this log factor that brings in new zeros at tau equal zero and tau equal one. Uh, that controls the space of functions. Well, there is the magic square story about this, um, about this product that I probably will have to skip because of the lack of time. And the key property is that then one can, if one soften a little bit, the behavior of functions near the boundary points of the homotopy integral, uh, saying that let's consider functions that have a little larger power, higher power in tau or one minus tau going to spaces h zero plus and h plus zero, then actually this is what allows one to control locality because it turns out that if one uses this uh, beta homotopy in the limit of beta to minus infinity, the contribution of h plus zero to uh, homology part completely goes away. And this means that the final result, all these terms do not contribute to the final result. If one uses this particular uh, homotopy operator. And uh, one can see that this is what actually takes care of four potentially non-local terms. Well, example of the, I'm approaching more or less the last part of my mm, talk. So one can compute vertices here, here. I'm giving an example of vertex that appears. This is a vertex that is a fourth order in fields at the level of equations of motion. So it corresponds to a quintic order at the action level. There is a particular ordering of omega and C here, which are implicit on the right-hand side. This is just a kernel. And one can see that this vertex obtained by the methods I just explained is free for all derivatives with respect to holomorphic variables or you know, the arguments between C, first and second factor of C, and that implies spin locality. This D1 and D2 are just derivatives with respect to the arguments of omegas. Moreover, it's ultra local that suggests that higher order are going to be local as well. I have to skip that. And uh, uh, basically uh, uh, one last comment is that uh, when talking about spin locality, there is another important possibility option to discuss this issue. Because spin locality, remember, was a story that would take two modules associated with given spin. And we demand that the primary fields associated with these models, these ground fields that contain the lowest possible number of derivatives, that only a finite number of descendants of these models should contribute. One ex can extend this consideration to currents because currents are themselves, they form modules of the higher spin algebras. And there are uh, primary components these primary components are nothing else as usual conserved currents that were a familiar one. The descendants correspond to improvements. So one little modification of the spin locality condition is that to demand that uh, the whole story is spin local if all fields and currents and, this, and uh, multi-particle fields or states, they are treated independently as modules of the space-time symmetry algebra. So I'm coming to conclusions uh, and conclusion is that this shifted homotopy scheme leads to uh, spin local higher spin vertices derived from the nonlinear equations. And we found some new local vertices, spin local vertices up to the quintic order. 
and this is uh, actually itself, uh, uh, it's a very strong result because it's, I mean, we're talking about infinite number of fields, all spins at once. It does not make spins make sense to consider higher spin fields, just a particular uh, vertex on its own beyond the cubic level and we are far beyond the cubic level. So uh, we found some number of uh, vertices in higher spin theory and all those that we have found so far up to very nonlinear ones. And this is not the only class, I mean, that I have shown, it was just an example. And the more maybe impressive example is omega CCC uh, vertex that is far less trivial and still spin local. So we identified the classes of functions that allow us to uh, prove theorems on locality of vertices and, uh, well, well, actually simplify computation a lot. And what we have found so far gives an indication that higher spin gauge theory is going to be spin local in higher orders. Uh, well, uh, we have not found all and uh, we cannot now claim that we can prove at the moment that uh, some of the vertices considered in the literature and argued to be non-local are spin local but we are quite optimistic in that respect. And of course, I mean, the uh, interesting problem would be to finish this program. I think it <clears throat> will be done. And then we will see whether or not uh, this spin locality survives in higher orders. And this is, I think, where I have to stop. So thank you uh, for your attention. So some questions. Um, so if I understand correctly, the way to obtain uh, non-localities is via a redefinition of the fields that involves derivatives infinite in number, right? Um, is it always clear that this respects the gauge symmetry that one starts with? Okay, split second. Yes, split second. It was a little bit difficult. Little bit difficult. So uh, an infinite number in derivatives yields non-localities from what I understand, right? If one makes a redefinition of the field that involves an infinite number of derivatives, then one obtains non-localities, if, if I understand correctly. Yes. So this, is it always that this respects the original gauge symmetry that Well, this is not gauge symmetry. I'm correctly. Uh, this is not a gauge, not a gauge transport. This is a filter definition. You just do some filter definition in your theory, and uh, everything is gauge invariant. But this means that the new variables you will have some new, uh, uh, some new uh, looking differently looking gauge symmetries, but still as many as in the original version. But it, it is just that you substitute, for instance, you have some phi cube. If instead of phi cube, you insert some uh, combination of phi prime with derivatives like phi prime <coughs> plus <coughs> d phi prime, d phi prime, and so on and so forth, you will get, and maybe infinite tail of those, you will get differently looking, but perturbatively the same theory, but it will look like non local. So that's what I'm talking about. Are the, Field definitions of that type. And the question, which is not at all trivial, is what is a best or minimally non local or even spin local choice of variables that makes the, the, the story local to go back? It's very easy to get some non local version, no problem. It's difficult to find the local version of that theory to, 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 to solve the problem other way. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, just, uh, just one question. Uh, I think during your lectures, you mentioned that the uh, relation between the spin locality and some other versions of locality could be subtle because of uh, extra terms once you take into account nonlinear corrections. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you say just one word or? Just... Yeah, this is actually an important point. Um, 
Uh, so, <coughs> yeah, mm, I'm not sure I have, I have some just in case uh, parts, but no, it's not here. Um, yeah, um, when we, in, I mean, I have been mentioning this in the lectures, but I had no time to discuss this in, in, in this talk. But indeed, when one goes to nonlinear corrections, there is an issue that the meaning of the field C uh, is not just a uh, derivative of the primary field of particular order. There are some shifts due to nonlinear corrections in the lowest orders. So this is a very important issue. So how does it affect the analysis? Uh, which one uh, analysis is most appropriate from representation theory, the analysis in, in terms of C is most appropriate, but from the usual setup of derivatives, space-time derivatives, it's, uh, it's, it's not most natural. So all I can say that this is a absolutely correct question that we of course understand and keep in mind. And uh, so far we don't have a comprehensive answer of what will be effect of that. So this, I think this is what I can say. Thank you. Thank you.